Reverend Harvey, Reverend Stevens, ladies and gentlemen, Christian friends, it is so mighty nice of you to come to church at 5 o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon, and I want you to know I appreciate it very much. I have had the privilege of being in this pulpit several times. I signed the guest book this afternoon, and Graham Hardy looked it up, and he found that I had been here on Sunday, the 12th of March, 1978, though I've been here several times, either before or since. And it's a privilege to be in this great church and in this historic pulpit with my friend of many years, Graham Hardy. He's a very popular and beloved preacher back in the United States and in my own church on Fifth Avenue in New York City. So it's great to be with you this afternoon. I've been sitting here looking over this fine congregation during the service, and I have decided that everybody here today is alive. Now I know that appearances are sometimes deceiving, but that is the way it appears from here. But it is also true that some people are more alive than others. Some have fullness of life, completeness of life. Some have only partial life. Now, there's one thing that every person here today would rather have than anything in the world, and that is life in its fullness. And I'd like to say that you have come to the right place to find it. For this institution is one of the great life-producing centers of the world. Because the great head of this institution said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Or as another version of the Bible has it, I have come that you might have life in all of its fullness. Now, I'd like to say to you that if you don't have life in all of its fullness, there's a way to get it. And that's what I want to talk to you about. The first way to have life, satisfaction, enthusiasm, excitement, is to get with Jesus. He's not a dull, musty character. He is a personification of life. Now, since I've been over here in Australia, I have been reading that Halley's Comet is in this part of the world. It has previously been in our section, but it has left us and come down under to you folks. But it doesn't seem to be anything very spectacular. They describe it as a fuzzy little ball looks somewhat like a potato. I haven't seen it on this trip, but I did see it the last time 
it was here. I saw it on a balmy spring night in 1910 in the city of Cincinnati, Ohio, USA, where my father was pastor of a small church. It appeared one night over our house, no less, on Spencer Avenue in Cincinnati. All the neighbors had gathered to see this miracle of the age. My father, my mother, my brother, and I were in the street looking up, and it was smack over our house. And it wasn't a fuzzy little ball that looked like a potato. It was a gigantic demonstration of the wonder of the of the universe. It had a head pointed toward the state of Kentucky at the south of us, and the tail swept up to the state of Michigan north of us. And we gazed at it in awe and wonder. I know I'm not exaggerating. This is the way it looked, and that's where it was. Now, my father was a preacher, but he was also of a scientific cast of mind, and he used this to preach to his sons and the neighbors a sermon about the greatness of God in his universe, how everything that God created was absolutely perfect and that it operated according to precise time schedules. My father said that comet there, Halley's Comet, will appear here again exactly 75.6 years from tonight on the moment and it'll be right over our house on I was so impressed. I said, gee, Dad, what do you know about that? Isn't that terrific? And then, caught by the uh, eternity of it, I said, do you suppose that I will be here 75 years from now when it comes back? He said, you know, I don't know about that. And I don't think that's the most important thing. He said the important thing is for you to amount to something before it comes back. Then, after we looked at the comet, my brother Bob and I were taken up to bed as usual. He was a little younger than I. We slept together in the same bed. We were inseparable until the day he died. And my mother came in, and she kissed us both on the cheek and said a prayer with us and told us to be good boys. And then my father, he didn't kiss us on the cheek. He tousled our heads, and he said, listen, you kids, life can be wonderful for both of you. You're poor boys. You haven't anything in a monetary sense. You've got to work your way throughout life, but life can be wonderful for you if you'll stick with Jesus all the way. So saying, he punched us in the chest and turned out the light and went downstairs. About 15 years after that, when he took me to college, he 
said, now, we've raised you as a Christian. You're going to be on your own down here. He said, if you ever get into any trouble with women or liquor or gambling or anything bad, don't lie to me. Come and level with me. And the Lord God and I will get you out of it. And then he got into the car. And I knew he could hardly speak. He said to me, remember what I told you? Stick to Jesus. And he'll make life wonderful for you. Then one day, years later... I heard that my father was dying. And I went up to the little Pennsylvania town where he was living. And I found him broken with a stroke, physically, but not his mentality. And when I had to say goodbye to him, I knew it was the last time I'd ever see him in this world. And he said, lean down over me, Norman. And he put his hand on my head. And he said, you remember what I told you? Stick to Jesus. And life will be wonderful for you. Now, that's a simple human story. And perhaps most of you have been raised in Christian homes by godly parents like that. But it's, it isn't complex or difficult. Life can be wonderful for you if you stick to him because he will give you a clean mind. he give you a healthy body. He'll give you a clean soul. He give you peace and joy and everything that goes to make life wonderful. There was read to you in your hearing today that text from the 10th chapter of John. I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I think that the deeper we are in the spirit, the closer we are to the creative and recreative power. We have more life in our minds, more life in our spirits, more life even in our body. For example, I knew a woman, a very brilliant but a psychologically mixed up lady. She enjoyed poor health, so to speak. She frequented all the doctor's offices in her town. She was said to be very delicate, a semi-invalid. She was 34 years of age at the time. She was a nominal Christian. She went to church occasionally and read the Bible infrequently, although she said her prayers every night. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. That's all the prayers she ever learned. And it isn't half bad at that. Her husband had to settle that he had a semi-invalid wife who wouldn't live very long. But one night, something happened to her. She got an idea that turned her life around. It was late March or early April, springtime for us, and they were walking down the street of this tree-shaded 
little town in New York State. She saw the spring flowers, the crocuses, the jonquils, and other spring flowers that were coming up even though snow I see it, I see it, I see it. And her husband thought she'd gone out of her mind. And he said, honey, what do you see? She said, it's the life force that's in all of nature. It's in these flowers. It's in the earth. It's in the trees. The life force. And that life force, which is in all nature, is in human nature also. She said, I now affirm that the recreative power of Almighty God who makes all things new is pulsating down through my head, through my entire body. I feel the rejuvenation of the life force. died after a while at age 96 after having lived, lived a vigorous and vital and constructive life. You see, Almighty God is the creator. He created you and he created me in the first place. And when we begin to run down spiritually, mentally, or physically, he recreates us. We are born anew. We become new creatures. That's the whole thrust of the gospel. So never be discouraged with yourself. Never. Because if you're a believer, you can be recreated. That's what it means to get the most out of life. Well, that's the way it happens to people. It surely does. If they believe. I remember once being in Tokyo. I've been there several times. And in Tokyo, I always visit a, an old Shinto temple. It is approached down a long corridor of shops. It's a very ancient Shinto temple with great bronze doors or gates. Outside of the temple is an gigantic urn likewise made of bronze they say it's about four or five hundred years old always steam is emitted from it and there is a vague perfume in this steam there is an old tradition that if you ail at any point in your body, if you will stand by this urn and waft the steam on the afflicted part, you'll get well. If you have a bad leg, you waft the steam on your leg. And if you have anything else wrong with you, you waft the steam on the place that well, I came up there one day, and there was only one man standing there, a big, nice-looking fellow. It was a, obvious to me that he was an American, and he was from Texas. Now, how did I know he was from Texas? He told me that he was. 
And beside, he had a big old Texas hat set rakishly on his head. And he was standing there waving the steam in the direction of his heart. So I, I stopped, and he recognized me for some reason or other. And he said, calling me by my first name, he said, Norman, you've heard this story about the fact that this steam will heal you if you get it on the afflicted part. And I said, yes, sir. What's your name? He said, Fred. He said, do you believe that? Well, I said, I tell you, Fred, faith is powerful in any form. And if you could believe this enough, maybe it just might heal you if you have any trouble. But I said, just to be sure, when you go home to Dallas, you see your doctor. Well, he said, I've had a heart attack. And they tell me if I have another one, that'll be it. So he said, I, I want to live. I'm only 47 years old, and I want to live. I don't want to die. He's huge, and I thought if he went on a diet, that would help some. But he said, what am I going to do? Well, I said, Fred, are you a Christian? He said, I sure am. I'm a Baptist. Well, I said, you go to church? He said, I go every Sunday when I'm home. I said, do you love Jesus? Fred. Oh, he said, yes, I've loved Jesus ever since I was a little poor fella. I said, do you believe in Jesus? He said, I believe in Jesus. I said, do you believe that he's with us now, standing right here? And he said, yes, I do. I said, do you believe that he'll be with you when you go to bed tonight in the hotel, Imperial? He said, yes, I do. I said, okay. When you lie down in bed tonight, you put your hand over your heart and say the following, let not your heart Only change it. Let not my heart be troubled. And then I said, image your hand, not as your hand, but as the great healing hand of Jesus Christ, healing you. And I believe you'll become a well man. He turned on me what I describe as a little boy look. And it broke me all up. And tears ran down his face. He said, I love Jesus. Well, after he'd gone away, I looked around to see if there was anybody around there that might possibly know me. And I said to myself, what is my weakest point? So I fanned the steam on my head. But as you can see, that hasn't done any good. But Fred found new life in his so, and he found new life in his mind and new life in his physical body. He was re 
created. Now, just one more point that I'd like to make about living life that's really great. It's to get on top of your defeats, whatever they are. And you can't get this many people together without having every defeat known to man represented in this company of people. We have to struggle against these defeats. Jesus Christ can give you victory over any defeat. And I know because I've had plenty and he's given me the victory over my defeat. I was speaking not so terribly long ago in our southern state of North Carolina at a kind of a motivational sales and management meeting in the evening and I was staying alone in a motel. I don't know whether you have motels around here or not, but you know, from the sound of it, it's not very high class. And at any rate, I went down to breakfast the next morning and went into the dining room of this motel or hotel and was greeted at the door by a middle-aged waitress who was clad in a kind of a golden yellow uniform with an apron. And she had a beautiful smile on her face. Now it was raining hard outside. And she said to me, Reverend Peel, isn't this a terrific morning. Well, I took a look out of the window and I said, well, I've seen better. Oh, she said, it's a terrific morning because God made it and anything God makes is beautiful. And I had to agree with that. Now she said, what are you going to have for breakfast? Well, it so happens that at the time I was on a diet. And I said, I tell you what you do, ma'am. You give me a poached egg on a plate, no butter on it, no bread with it. And she said, are you going to eat that? I said, well, I have to to get off a few pounds. Now, she said, Reverend Peel, I'm not going to treat you like that. Suppose I went home and told my husband that I had mistreated you in that way. Oh, I said, I don't want you to tell your husband that. Well, she said, I'm going to give you a good old down south breakfast. Now, if any of you folks have ever been in the southern states of the United States, you know what a down south breakfast is. It consists of bacon and ham and eggs and biscuits and grits and the works and i don't believe in hurting anybody's feelings ever so out of the generosity and kindness of my heart i ate the breakfast finally i said to her ma'am you know you are so wonderful got a great spirit you just got to be a Christian. There's no other way to explain you. She said, I am a Christian. And I found the Lord. And I've been happy ever since. She said, it was all due to a text out of the Bible. One with which I'm sure you are very familiar. She said, it's Luke 9, 1. Well, frankly, I hadn't the slightest idea what Luke 9, 1 was, but I didn't want to reveal my ignorance, so I said, ma'am, you know, there are many different versions of the Bible today. Which version is yours? Why, she said, I'm a King James woman. And I said, well, I am too. Quote to me, I said, 
your particular version of that familiar, well-known passage. And she said, it reads, and Jesus called his disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to heal diseases. Now she said, I had a devil. It was poverty. I had been raised in the utmost poverty. We didn't have anything. And I finally married a boy down the street, and he was as poor as I was. And we got married on nothing. And I hated poverty. And so did my husband. And we became mean and bitter. And we hated everybody because we suffered poverty. And then in a little church down on the roadway at the corner, at a revival meeting one night, my husband and I found the Lord. And he took all the hatred out of us and all the bitterness. And then, you know, something wonderful happened. When our minds were freed of all that hate and bitterness, we were able to think. And we thought objectively and intellectually and prayerfully. And one night while we were thinking together, we got an idea about a little business that we could operate. And this little business has prospered so that we are fairly well off today. And she said, I work here for breakfast every day in this hotel to get a little extra money to send my third child to college. And we've put two through college all ready. She said, we have never lived until he came and set us free in our minds from hate and from resentment. And then when I went out of the restroom that morning, she said, praise his name, the blessed Lord Jesus, who gives us life. Well, that sounds like an old-time evangelistic sermon, doesn't it? I don't know what it sounds like, but that is its intent. For I feel commissioned by the good God to witness to as many people as I can in my lifetime that the way to life is by the great Savior who said, I've come that you might have life in all of its fullness. So tell you what you do. Stick to Jesus. God bless you, everyone. There's only one Norman Vincent Peale, isn't there? And I'm sure we've all been catching his spirit, his that vitality and the faith that just radiates through him physically and 
in his whole being. Thank you, Dr. Peel. We won't forget your message. And I know that many of you will want to uh, purchase the uh, cassette so that you can replay it and relive it when you get home and share it with others. Don't forget that uh, there's an opportunity tomorrow of uh, hearing Dr. Peel speak again in the seminar uh, that you read about as you get handed the uh, programs as you leave the service today. Uh, I'm sure that the arrangements are made that these programs are there available as you leave at the door. And we hope many of you will be able to get over to Homebush tomorrow morning. <laughs>